Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Hymax's stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Hymax is a fabless semiconductor company. Fabless means the company outsources manufacturing of its silicon wafers or chips. Fab is short for fabrication which is just another word for manufacturing. Hymax is a market leader in display driver internet circuits and timing controllers used in TVs, laptops, monitors, mobile phones, tablets, digital cameras, car navigation, virtual reality devices, and other consumer electronic devices. Google is one of its customers for its liquid crystal on silicon glasses, as you can see here. Samsung and Mercedes are customers for its touch and display integration devices. It has 10% of the driver market share. It has over 10% of the integrated circuit market share in LCD smartphones. 38% in tablets and 33% in automotive. The company has over 200 customers across Taiwan, China, Japan, Korea, US, and Europe. It has over 3,000 patents granted and 500 pending approval. The company is headquartered in Taiwan and was founded in 2001. It trades on the Nasdaq, Deutsche Börse, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 2.2 billion market cap. They're trading at $13 a share and they have 174 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So their growth has been really impressive. They had negative free cash flow in 18 and 19, positive 100 million in 2020, and then positive 267 million in the trailing 12 months. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that also grows a lot as well from 6 million way up to 326 million. Revenue is a sales for the company and that pretty much doubled from 2018 to the trailing 12 months. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that grew from 169 million to 600 million. Below that is their operating expenses. These are all the expenses not directly related to generating the revenue. R&D is an example of an operating expense. Gross profit minus operating expenses gives you your operating income. That grew from 4 million to 400 million. More than 100x growth. Unreal. They paid 1 million of interest on their debt, which is the lowest they paid in the past several years which is pretty much nothing compared to over 400 million of operating income. Below that is other income or expenses. These are all the gains or losses not part of the company's core operations. Below that is their pre-tax income, then their taxes, and the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which was negative in 2019, but positive in every other year. And it grew a ton from 6 million to 326 million. This is their income statement from their latest quarterly report. This shows us the second quarter of 2021, the third quarter of 2020, and the third quarter of 2021. Their revenue grew a ton from 240 million to 420 million. Their cost of revenue is 204 million. That means their gross profit margin is 51%. The median gross profit margin in their industry is 48%. So they're slightly above the median, but the median net profit margin is 10%, they're 28%. They're much higher net profit margin. In the first nine months of this year, their revenue is higher than any full year. And they only sold 900 million units, which is a lot less than prior years, and their revenue is higher. That's why their margins are going up so much. Look at their gross margins for the first nine months of 2021. It's 47%. The reason my number is 51% is because I just did the third quarter of 2021. Revenue is really important, but margins are equally as important. Because what would you rather have? A million of revenue and zero profit, or $500,000 of revenue and $100,000 of profit? Of course you would want half the revenue because you're making money. When you have a million dollars of revenue, you have no profit. 
And that's how you run a business on profits. You need cash flow to run a business. Most of their sales are in China, 336 million in China, 85 million in the rest of the world. That could be a problem if there's a recession in China. I don't foresee that happening, but that's just something to consider when investing in this company. Their R&D is 51 million, research and development, general and administrative expenses 9 million, sales and marketing is 8 million. So their operating income went from 9 million to 148 million. Their net income went from 8 million to 118 million. In the second quarter of 2021, their net income was 108 million. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. And just another reason to invest in this company. They grew from 4 million to 274 million. That's nearly 70x growth. They only spent 7 million in CapEx. That was 50 million in 2018 and 19. They don't actually manufacture the chips. It's very complex to manufacture semiconductor chips, but they do some manufacturing at their company. CapEx is investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And you could see it was negative in 18 and 19 because they were investing back into their business. Now they have a big positive. It seems like a really well-run business. In the past few years, they haven't really added much debt. They add a similar amount as they've been paying down. But they're paying less interest on their debt. In the trailing 12 months, they issued $447 million of low interest debt to pay down $410 million of high interest debt. That's how they're lowering their interest payments. Even though they have more debt, they're paying less interest. Similar to when you refinance your home, your principal balance may be higher but your mortgage payments are lower. It looks like they may have done some acquisitions in the trailing 12 months because their investing cash flow was 124 million and only 7 million in CapEx. Acquisitions go into investing cash flow. So does CapEx. This is their operating cash flows from their quarterly report. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net income, then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement, then adjust for changes in working capital. So they had 118 million of net income. We add back 30 million of income tax expense, 5.3 million of depreciation and amortization. The taxes reported on their income statement are not the actual taxes they paid. Those are the taxes according to the accounting rules. It looks like they actually paid 8.9 million of taxes. And they had lots of cash outflow. It looks like they extended lots of credit, 72 million of accounts receivables. So when you sell a product on credit, you don't receive any money. You're giving a product without receiving anything. So it's a cash outflow. But when you do receive the money from the customer, then it's a cash inflow. They purchased 28 million of inventory. Last year, they had a cash inflow of 34 million of inventory. That means they took the inventory off their balance sheet and put it onto the income statement. They reported an accounting gain of 118 million, but they actually only generated 61 million of cash flow. Last year was a counting gain of 8 million and they generated 33 million of cash flow. It seems like the main reason cash flow was low in the third quarter of 2021 was this 72 million of accounts receivables. But that just means cash flow will be even higher when those customers pay for those items, which could be next quarter or the quarter after that. Changes in working capital are more of a timing thing. Here's their investing cash flow from their statement of cash flows, the third quarter of 2020, the third quarter of 2021. They invested 2.1 million in PP&E, 8.4 million of acquisitions. They received 4 million from the disposal of financial assets. They had a cash outflow of 33 million from refundable deposits. In their investing section, they had a cash outflow of 33 million. Last year was pretty much flat. This is their financing section from their statement of cash flows. They paid 47 million in dividends in the third quarter, but they didn't pay any dividends last year. The 4,000 of dividends they paid is to their preferred shareholders, not their common shareholders. They received 233 million of debt. They paid down 186 million of debt. It looks like they paid down 47 million on some type of debt. And their financing section, they had a cash outflow of 50 million. Last year was a cash inflow of 2 million. This is the equity section on their 930 balance sheet. They have 728 million of equity. They raised 200 million from selling their business and they profited half a billion from running their business. Retained earnings is a sum of all your prior net incomes 
minus the sum of the dividends you paid out. Let's look at the capital structure. 700 million of equity, 200 million of debt. They're 78% equity, 22% debt. And they could pay off all the debt with the cash on that balance sheet and still have 45 million of cash left over. And I gave them the highest whack on Finbox, 9%, to be conservative. You can see Taiwan is a pretty secure country to invest in. Their Moody's rating is AA3, the highest is AAA, the second highest is AA1, then AA2, then AA3. Their country risk premium is only 60 basis points. The average of all the countries is 432 basis points. So it's a pretty low risk country. Since a majority of their sales are in one country, and that country is China, that's why I gave them the highest whack. If a majority of their sales were in the US, I'd probably give them a lower whack. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for, that's 3.8 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $3.3 billion. We divide that by 174 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $19. They're trading at $13. So trading at a 33% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Their revenues projected to increase 2.8%. So I grew it 2.8% for the next few years. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To get their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I summed up these two free cash flow numbers and I divided by the sum of these two revenue numbers. And that comes out to 16%, so I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 16%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. Simply, Wall Street's at $23 a share. They're saying it's 45% undervalued. This is where the stock has been trading the last two years. So you can see it was under $5 for a while. Then in 2020, the stock went parabolic. It shot way up to over $15. And there's been lots of trading activity. If there's a green line down here, that means the buy orders are higher than the sell orders and the stock price goes up. The higher the line, the more trading activity. When there's a red line, that means the sell orders are higher than the buy orders and the stock goes down. So it would have been great to get in down here. Even now, it still seems like the stock is a great value. The company's doing an amazing job at growing their revenue and growing their margins. The stock is volatile. The beta is two, so the stock moves two times the market. It's gone up 57% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 23%. The 52-week low is seven, the high is 18. And the stock is trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. Over seven million shares have been traded on average the past 10 days. Of the 174 million shares outstanding, 117 million are on float. 28% are held by institutions, and it has a pretty high short percentage. 13% of the shares are shorted. They pay a pretty good dividend, 2.15%. They did not pay a dividend in 2019 and 2020, but they brought their dividend back in 2021. And you can see it's only 15% of their net income, 18% of their free cash flow, so they can easily afford this and even raise it, which I think there's a good chance of them doing. They pay a higher dividend than their industry, their industry pays 1.1%. Analysts are forecasting them to grow their dividend to 11.4%. That's a pretty big growth. Their employee count has been pretty flat the past six years. They employ 2,000 people. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd be extremely happy at $135,000 today. That's a 30% annual return. The general public owns 43% of the company. Insart is 28% institutions 24% and hedge funds 5%. The founder and CEO is the biggest shareholder at 21%, which means his stock is worth nearly half a billion dollars. The next biggest shareholder owns 6%, then 5%, and then Acadian Asset Management owns 3.5%, and ARC Finance 2%. Let's look at their financial ratios. Unbelievable, a PE of seven. That's stock price over earnings per share. A P.E. below 15 is considered a really good value. But when you see a P.E. below 15, it's generally a company that's not growing much. Their growth should be stabilized at that point. For a company that's growing at this rate and a P.E. of 6.8 is just unheard of. They have a really good price to sales of 1.6, that's stock price over sales per share. 
and a good price to book of 3.0. That's stock price of a book value per share. Let's look at their non-current assets, 14 million of financial assets. The big one is 134 million of PP&E. This is net of depreciation. 28 million of goodwill. Goodwill is the price you pay to acquire another company minus the net assets. 87 million of deposits and 20 million of other. Look at their return on invested capital, 48%. They can easily cover their interest payments with their operating income. ROE of 45%, that's net income over equity. They provide amazing value to their equity holders. They can cover their current liabilities with their current assets two times, and their quick ratio is 1.7. Let's look at their current assets, 229 million of cash, 400 million of accounts receivables, this is how much money other companies owe HIMAX, 106 million of inventory, and 156 million of restricted cash. Restricted cash is cash that's set aside for a specific purpose. Let's look at their current liabilities, 151 million of debt, 224 million of accounts payable. This is how much money HIMAX owes other companies. 61 million of income taxes payable. These are taxes that are due to the government within one year. This could include different taxes such as income tax or social security tax. They have 19 million of contract liabilities and 44 million of other. They generated 267 million of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. They have over 500 million of working capital. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. And they pay out 47 million of dividend payments. So they have over $700 million of funding. So they're well capitalized. They shouldn't need any debt or equity financing to get through the next 12 months. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 68 companies in the same industry as HiMax. And HiMax doesn't spend much in CapEx. Foundries spend much more in CapEx. Taiwan Semiconductor is the largest foundry in the world. And you can see they spend $25 billion in CapEx. Their debt to equity ratio is much better than average. They pay a nice dividend, higher than most companies. Their free cash flow is a lot lower than average. In terms of market cap, they rank 41. That just shows you how undervalued this company is. And look at their price multiples. Price to book, much better than average. Price to earnings, unbelievable, under seven. Price to free cash flow is eight, the average is 36. And their price to sales is 1.6, the average is 9. Their revenue is lower than average, but they're a much smaller company than the average in the industry. There's some really big companies. They have a good ROA and an amazing ROE. To summarize, I have them trading at a 33% discount. And this company is putting up amazing numbers. I would not be surprised if their stock doubled or tripled this year. They're in a really hot industry. There's so much demand for semiconductors. The demand far outweighs the supply. If you listed all the semiconductors, you can throw a dart and make money because it seems like all of them have so much upside. I ranked their free cash flow 6 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratios 10 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.